In this video, I'm going to cover everything about efficiency for GCSE physics. Efficiency is the ratio of useful energy transfer to total energy transfer. I'm Kit, and this is Gorilla Physics, and here I'm going to show you everything you need to know to get a grade 9. Have a go at the experiment at the end of this video and leave a comment to tell me your conclusions. Efficiency tends to not be something that people struggle with too much. However, they can ask you some hard questions, so stick around. And also in this video, there is a challenge, a little experiment that I want you to give a go. All you need really is a ball and a ruler or a tape measure or some way to measure some distances. Have a little crack at these, first of all, because actually I think that you'll manage them. You'll manage them based off what we've already covered in energy topics so far, which is the use of equations to calculate the size of energy stores. So pause the video now and have a little go. So calculate the electrical energy transferred by a two kilowatt kettles, which runs for six minutes. There's nothing really hard about that. You just need to recall the equation. Energy is power times time, but you do need to be aware that you must convert into watts and you must convert into seconds. So 2000 watts is two kilowatts and six times 60, six minutes, each one having 60 seconds gives you an energy in joules of 720,000 joules. Calculate the thermal energy gained by two kilograms of water raised from 20 degrees C to boiling. I haven't told you the temperature that it finishes up, but you know the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, so the temperature change is 80. The specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules. So you use the equation that you are given that on a formula sheet, energy is mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change, which is two, two kilograms. You use kilograms, you don't convert into grams. 4,200 is the specific heat capacity and 80 degrees was the temperature change. So 672,000 joules is the energy transferred to the water. Now actually those two questions are linked. And in fact, the electrical energy supplied to the kettle is not exactly the same as the thermal energy given to the water. Some of that energy has gone elsewhere. Some of that energy has been wasted. And that's the whole idea of efficiency, that actually we can never get a perfect transfer from one store to another with all of the energy going where we wanted it to go. So the last question is a little bit of a leading question because actually I've just asked you to express a number out of another number and that's what efficiency is. We express the useful out of the total. So actually that last question really asks you to calculate the efficiency of this kettle. Express 672,000 joules out of 720,000 joules as a percentage. And really that question means, in this case, calculate the efficiency of the kettle. The efficiency is the useful output energy divided by the total input energy. Now to turn that into a percentage, you can multiply it by 100. And calculating something as a percentage is something that I'm sure that you'll have done in maths and you shouldn't really find too difficult. So 672,000 divided by 720,000 times by 100 gives you an efficiency or a percentage of 93%. That's all there is to efficiency really. So if you can do that, then you should be all right with this topic. I will look at some of the ways they can make this hard though. So have a little pause and think about this claim. A teacher states that the only appliance that can ever be considered 100% efficient is a room heater. Evaluate the validity of this claim. So what is it true? Valid, something that's valid is something that is the case, something that, that is true. Pause the video now, have a little think and tell me why you think that might be valid and why you think it's probably not valid. During any energy transfer, some of the energy is transferred to the thermal store of the surroundings. It is dissipated, we say. A space heater is actually designed to heat the surroundings. This room heater is meant to heat up the room, the surroundings. So the wasted heating is actually useful. We want this heater to heat the surroundings. However, it's also gonna heat itself up and it's gonna heat the walls up. And we only really want it to heat the air. So we could call the heating of the heater and the heating of the walls a wasted energy store. We do want this heater to heat up the surroundings and we say for any energy transfer, we're always going to get heating of the surroundings. We're always going to get energy dissipation. But actually think exactly what you want this thing to do. You only want it to really heat the air. Now, for me, this can never be valid because nothing can ever be 100% efficient. We're always getting some wasted forms. We're always getting some energy transferred into stores that we didn't want. So it's just a matter of really thinking very carefully about what those wasted stores are. Usually it's going to be the thermal store of the surroundings. And in fact, that's where all energy will eventually end up during any energy transfer. It will always be dissipated in the form of heat. 
So let's talk a little bit more about efficiency then. Energy analysis is what we've been talking about so far. Calculate one store, use that value to calculate something about another store. So it's great for predicting unknown quantities. However, it's got a flaw. The flaw is that every single time we transfer some energy, we end up wasting some of that energy. And so the starting store is always slightly greater than the final store, the useful final store at least. So energy transfers can never be 100% efficient. And that is because whenever we do any transfer ever, we always end up transfer some energy by heating to the surroundings. We always end up dissipating some of that energy. And the image that I picked there, there for this slide it's just this idea that we're working on something and we don't want to but inadvertently we will always heat that thing up somewhat so this simple model that we've been talking about the idea that one store empties and another store fills is a bit limited is not as simple as this situation there's always some other store that it goes into as well there's always some wasted store we call that we call the store that we didn't intend the one that we don't want to fill we call that the wasted store efficiency is defined as the ratio of energy which is usefully transferred so let's try a different diagram to represent this let's try this is called a Sankey diagram and it just shows you like a graph would that this is the value of the initial energy store this transfer one is the useful energy store but some of that energy some of that initial energy has actually gone and been wasted through this route it's gone into this other energy store that we didn't want to fill if we could solve this then we would have no energy crisis we would have no energy worries because all of the energy that we actually use would be transferred usefully and we could therefore use that value again but we're always accidentally we're always wasting energy to heating of the surroundings the more efficient something is, the larger the useful arrow will be on that type of diagram. The less efficient, the larger the wasted arrow will be. So when I so look closely at that, def, that definition, efficiency is the ratio of which energy is usefully transferred. Something would be perfectly efficient if all of the energy was usefully transferred, it would have a ratio of one or a hundred percent. If half of the energy was wasted, it would have a ratio of 0.5 or 50%. If it was 75% efficient, then for every 100 joules of energy we supplied, 75 joules of that would end up where we wanted it to be, where we usefully intended it to go, and only 25 would be wasted. So we can define efficiency also by using the equation though, and it says the exact same thing. Efficiency equals the useful output energy divided by the total input energy. That's the ratio that is usefully transferred. So let's take this for example, this is charging of a phone, pause the video. The values you need are just in the diagram rather than in the question. So we've started with 84,000 joules of energy in the electrostatic store of the mains. We've done 72,000 joules through electrical working into the chemical store of the battery, but we've wasted 12,000 joules through heating to the thermal store of the surroundings. So write out the equation, input the numbers in, the useful is the one we want, the chemical store of the battery. So to get this question right, you just need to identify what's the useful, what's the total. 72,000 divided by 84,000 gives you 86%, 0.86 or 86%. And you can use either, you can express your answers to efficiency questions either as decimals or as percentages. So you're totally happy with whichever one. Here's another question, read it, pause the video, have a go for yourself and then unpause and check your working. So here's a nice car, we've got 3.5 megajoules of energy in the chemical store of the fuel that we put into the car. We've transferred that by mechanical work into a kinetic store and we've got one megajoule of energy in the kinetic store. That's the one we wanted, we want the car to move but 2.5 megajoules of that has gone into the thermal store of the surroundings. So what is the efficiency? So one is the useful, and we don't need to actually convert here because we've got megajoules and megajoules, the conversion factor is gonna cancel itself out anyway. So one divided by 3.5, one megajoule divided by 3.5 megajoules gives you 29%. So that car is 29% efficient. So just to summarize what you should know about conservation and about dissipation of energy. So the law of conservation energy, remember, states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, just transferred from store to store. Now, well, there's two ways we can use energy, useful or waste. We need to be able to identify which one is useful and which one is waste in these questions. 
there's no change in the total energy of the system though. So in every transfer of energy, there's some energy transfer to the surroundings. And that's usually a wasted store, a wasted form of energy. We call this heating of the surroundings dissipation of energy. Now the decrease in one store is equal to the increase of the other stores. So really our simple model of just having a starting store and a final store is fine if we're just describing what's going on, but it ignores the idea that actually whenever we do any transfer, we always increase the thermal store of the surroundings. So actually the chemical store of the fuel, if this was, let's say the example of the car, our starting store, the decrease in our starting store is equal to the increase of the other stores. The more efficient it something is, the more of that energy is going to go into the useful store. Efficiency, we can define it as the ratio of useful energy or power transferred to the total energy or power. So what ratio is transferred usefully? It can be expressed as a decimal or a percentage. So there's two equations and you need to memorize both of them, but they're basically the same. There's, so there's two equations and you need to memorize both of them. Efficiency is useful output energy transfer over input energy transfer or efficiency is useful power output over total power input. Now there is no difference to those two equations. It's just that one of them is dealing with energy and the other is dealing with rate of energy transfer. Efficiency is worked out in the same way for both though. You just need to know whether you're using energy or whether you're using power. So it doesn't matter if you're using joules and joules or watts and watts, it just needs to be the same. And you're just working out useful over total. There are ways that we can increase the efficiencies of, of some things by reducing those unwanted energy transfers. So if we can actually lubricate something maybe to stop it heating up as much, we can make it more efficient. To get these questions right, my pro tip is you need to practice identifying the use useful and total energies in any given situation. Now, sometimes they will give you the wasted energies and not the useful. And you need to first work out the useful before you work out the efficiency. And sometimes as in the questions in this PowerPoint, there were some examples where we gave you energies on diagrams rather than in questions. So they won't necessarily state this is the useful one, but they expect you to be able to identify which one was the useful store and which one was the starting store. Now, these are math skills, but you need to be good at working with fractions, decimals, and percentages. They're all equivalent to each other. The equation is a fraction. If you just type in a fraction in a calculator, you can get a decimal. If you want to turn a decimal into a percentage, you multiply by 100, or you can move that decimal place two times. Have a go with an experiment and comment how your experiment went. What conclusions did you make? I'm really interested to see how this goes. This is a really, really common and a very easy experiment for you to conduct because you only need to take two measurements. It's a very straightforward experiment, but I'm going to lead you through the math to show you why it's so straightforward. So first of all, we're talking about this ball, which we're dropping from a certain height, H1. And I want you to identify the initial energy store and the useful final energy store. Hopefully you've got that. The initial energy store is the potential energy at that point and the useful energy store, let's call that the potential energy at the top of the bounce. So the efficiency of the bounce is gonna be related to how high up the thing gets. If it was perfectly efficient, then it would reach the same height again after the first bounce. So the initial energy store is MGH1, that is gravitational potential, mass times G, gravitational field strength times height, H1, the height we drop it from. The useful energy store is MGH2, so mass times gravitational field strength times height two, that's both gravitational stores, so nice and simple there. Now substitute those into the equation for efficiency. Efficiency is useful output over total, and you get MGH2 useful over MGH1. Now actually, because you've got M and G on both lines, you can actually just cancel that and simplify the whole equation. So now we've got efficiency is actually equal to H2 over H1. So the height of the bounce divided by the height of the drop. And that is a very simple way to calculate the efficiency of a ball. So what you're gonna to need to do is find some sports balls, find some tennis balls, compare that to a football, any balls that you've got lying around the house. And I want you to actually have a little hypothesis first and think why you think one of them may be more or less efficient. Do that before you've actually dropped one. And think about the energy transfers that are going on as the thing bounces. What will make something good at bouncing or less good at bouncing? Think about where that extra energy is going. Which one of the balls that you've picked, which ones are going to transfer more energy to the thermal of the surroundings. 
Now there are two methods I'm going to present to you. You can pick whichever one you want to do. The first one is if you've got lots of different types of balls, it's a really useful way to compare them. So what you're going to do is take as many different balls as you can, drop them from the same height, drop them all from one meter or two meters or whatever is easiest for you to measure and measure their bounce height. Now decide on how you're going to do that as accurately as possible. I have some suggestions. You could use your phone or any camera to kind of record it so you could actually stop the frame where it's at the highest and have a ruler in the background so you can actually measure the height of that bounce or you can simply just crouch down and drop it a few times and just try and judge by being at the same height as the bounce exactly where that highest point was. Decide if you want to do many repeats. If you're going to use the method with a phone camera, then perhaps you don't need to do any repeats because one time is going to give you enough accuracy. But maybe if you're doing it by eye, you would want to do that three times to be able to spot any anomalies, discard them and calculate an average of your results. Then use the equation that we derived on the previous slide to work out the efficiency of each ball. So lastly, review your hypothesis and conclude what should you take into account if you wanted to design a ball that was as bouncy as possible, as efficient at bouncing as possible, what would you take? Take into account how would you design that ball the second method is a little bit more involved but will give you greater accuracy is to actually use one ball or do this for a, a couple of balls but it will take you a bit longer and drop it from a range of different heights actually drop it from 25 centimeters 50 centimeters 75 centimeters and so on up to two meters so if you plot a graph of bounce height against drop height as in the picture here your gradient will be the efficiency represented as a decimal now gradients are less affected by anomalies than arithmetic means. So they're really, really good for accurate averages. I'm not going to talk through all of these because it'll be different for everyone's experiment, but here's two slides that will actually help you evaluate your practical, work through each keyword in turn and think about each point how could you improve each point? When you write an evaluation, these are the key terms you need to consider and consider how you did for each one and then how you could actually improve that if you were to do this practical again. And here are some sentence starters to get you started evaluating your practical. Over to you, I'd really love to hear some conclusions of how your practical went, what you thought was the most efficient ball and any difficulties you got into. This is a good, fun way for you to get into physics to actually do some experimenting at home. And there's a challenge question at the end. I hope that was useful. Make sure you subscribe to Guerrilla Physics and just comment boom if you found that useful.